Hi, everybody. My name is John DePietro. And I'm Bob Zagami. And welcome to the Camper Report Show. Hey, it's the Camper Report Show. I can't believe it's another week yeah. with so much exciting RV news. And we're going to tell everybody about the latest breaking news in the RV industry. And, Bob, I understand that you've got a very interesting interview with a man with very famous initials. Talk about LCI. Well, uh, Libet Components, Inc. Or those that his initials well they are actually the l the l is his so we're going to talk with jason lippert the ceo who's done an amazing job turning it from a 80 million dollar company to a three billion dollar company billion with the b billion with a b that means big yeah yeah uh -huh. <laughs> right and i'm going to be talking with byron hickox who's a town administrator in Waynesville, North Carolina. And if you remember last week, the RV news waves were filled with stories of a little town in the Smoky Mountains of Western North Carolina that said that they don't want any RV parks in town. Well, it created a furor amongst the RV industry. I've got the whole story and I'm gonna tell you that RVers are now going to like Waynesville, North Carolina. Good, sounds good. So those stars and more coming up on this edition of the Camper Report Show. Stay with us, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to this segment, the new segment of the Camper Report Show. Bob, there's so much going on with this COVID talk. And you know what? People say it's going to have an impact on the RV industry, and although it's, it's sad news to hear of all the people that have been sick with it, it's really been a benefit to the industry as far as making people more aware of the RV industry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a continuing story, and although there's been some upticks in the virus nationwide, it does indeed bode very well for the RV dealers and the campgrounds because we offer them safe, secure transportation, uh, vacation alternatives, certainly to other forms of uh, vacations they might consider taking. So as it remains in the headlines, we certainly won't, we certainly don't want to not talk about it, but we want to make sure that it's done in a positive way, that there are very, you know, tremendous number of benefits for RVers and campers. Yeah, exactly. Benefits. And, you know, talk about uh, the industry. Um, just today, uh, Winnebago introduced several new models, and I know that you spent a good portion of the time on the uh, internet watching some of that. Talk a little bit about some of the programs that, uh, not some of the programs, but some of the new models that Winnebago introduced or reintroduced today. Yeah, they did a, a tremendous job on their uh, launching of the new products because they can't do it in person, and they didn't have a dealer meeting this year, so it was uh, hyped up quite a bit, and it lived up to the expectations. I think the uh, probably the hottest thing that they had, uh, the newest thing is the, uh, and what was the name of it? The Echo? Yeah, the Echo. Yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of like a rebel, uh, a rebel on steroids. Well, when you, you know, I looked at the pictures, and I'm sure that we'll have some pictures here that folks can see as we present this right now, but um, it's 22 feet, and it's on a Ford Transit chassis. And uh, interestingly, most of the um, Class Cs that Winnebago has produced recently have been on the Mercedes Sprinters, um, namely the View and the uh, Vita. Yep. I, I didn't have any advance notice of it, but I've been telling the dealers, the Winnebago dealers here, uh, that I thought that they would, would come out with something on the Ford Transit, but I thought it would be a conventional class c and this is actually uh built on the transit all-wheel drive chassis much higher up off the ground and it does and it is in fact equipped for the it's for the same buyer that buys the rebel but thinks it's too small so they want a little bit bigger so now they've got a class c with all the amenities of the rebel in terms of lit lithium batteries and and uh the off-road capability of taking some of their toys with them. They've got all of that built into it, and it's a Class C. So it's, it's going to get a lot of attention. It won't be, dealers won't see it until the spring. Uh, they also brought out a uh, redesigned or a, a re-engineered 
hike. The first, the original one had a couple of things people didn't necessarily like, but uh, they trailer. had to fix those and, and increase the uh, capabilities. They got the track system around it that allows you to bring bikes and, and kayaks. So that's, that deal is going to welcome that change. Right. Uh, you see both, the, those, both of those are aimed at that out outdoor adventure crowd because that is the crowd that is the gaining more and more momentum, not probably because they wanted to, but because COVID has made it almost mandatory that if you want to get out, you got to get out where there are not a lot of people. So um, both of the, you know, the Revel and the, uh, the Echo would provide that capability. I think the Echo is just going to probably provide probably a bigger bathroom and um, more, um, I don't know if luxurious is the right word, sleeping accommodations. Yeah, they, they, they put a bathroom that we saw come out in Europe a couple of years ago, and it's really uh, very creative where one of the walls actually moves. So you get, when you get in there, you get your toilet in the sink, and to do that, but if you want to take a shower, you actually take the wall and move it around. It's on an axis, so that sink disappears, and it opens up to a, uh, a shower stall. So that's uh, very innovative on yeah. what they've done there. And they've also um, done a great job in making RVing accessible to um, folks with mobility issues. Yep, they brought out a new Inspire, uh, an additional line, uh, additional product in the accessibility uh, enhanced product line. A uh, lot of lot of talk about that one. And then they brought out a new diesel pusher with three new floor plans, brand new from the ground up. They just took a blank piece of paper and said. What can we do different? And uh, looks like they brought out something that is going to get a lot of attention. It's called the Journey. It's a name they used a few years back, but they brought back the name and a very exciting diesel pusher. But more importantly, because we all look at RVs on the outside and we say, oh, they all look the same. This is so different on the inside because they have a, an interior designer on staff, Kim Cam. We, we met her a few years back at the open house and she has just totally turned the tables on how you design the interior of a motorhome. It looks like a luxury house. And that, that was her intent when she designed it. So uh, you know, that's going to get a lot of attention. You know, that. it's and beautiful. Absolutely beautiful motorhome. With that being said, one of the places that hopefully this time next year that we'll be able to um, view those Winnebago products is at the America's largest RV show, which is in um, Hershey. I was going to say Harrisburg, but just down the road from Harrisburg in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And uh, obviously the show was um, shortened this year, uh, canceled this year back in September. But um, our good friend, Gary Bunzer, known as the RV doctor, was always the person that was kind of their, uh, their public face uh, for that show. And they had their annual meeting not too long ago. And Susquehanna Valley RV Company, at the annual meeting, they won the Education Award, which is now the Gary Bunzer Education Award. So they're keeping the spirit of Gary Bunzer alive. And I think that's very important. Gary did seminars there for years, and he was the face of yeah. the show. And he passed away from COVID-19 COVID. in, in yep. April of this year, unfortunately. And he's a great guy. And uh, a lot of people got trained, both tech, uh, technicians and uh, consumers that went to the show. So it was nice to see Heather and the association down there rename that for the Gary Bunzer Education Award. Look at how this segment is flowing. We talk about manufacturers and we talk about the RV shows that they uh, can go to to see these new units. And then after they purchase them, they go camping and many of them will go to KOAs. And you've got some KOA convention news. KOA has been doing their uh, expo virtually this week and I've sat in on several of the sessions. And uh, wear a yellow shirt. I did not wear a yellow shirt because it was virtual. They couldn't see me. So I didn't have to worry. But they did, uh, this morning, they did announce their parks. And they, they have big awards. And uh, we've got some New England awards. We're not going to talk about those tonight. But uh, we'll talk about those on our other show. But the park of the year is in Pueblo. It's Pueblo KOA Journey in Colorado. 
the Rising Star Award went to Coloma St. Joseph KOA Holiday there in Benton Harbor, Michigan. In the campground of the year, who also got the President's Award, who also got the Founders Award, is the Ventura KOA Holiday in California. So congratulations to all those people. And as we always say, uh, if you're going to go camping next year, you better make your reservations early. So there's three new ones that are up in the headlights and the headlines. So if you want to visit one of the award-winning KOA campgrounds next year, make your reservations. Make your reservations early. early. Make your yeah. reservations early. So yeah. we want to um, say that's a wrap on the news, but we've got two more great segments coming up. Bob's talking with Jared Lippert. And Jason, Jason, uh, Jason, Jason, Jared, Jason, and eh, I got whatever. So it's from LCI, regardless. And um, we're going to be talking with someone from Waynesville, North Carolina. This is the Camper Report Show. Stay with us. We'll be back with those segments right after these very important messages. And welcome back to the Camper Report Show, everyone. My name is John DePietro, and you know what? There is a situation that has taken place in a great little town in Western North Carolina that was kind of misconstrued in the media. And um, basically, it sounded like when you read the headlines that this town didn't like RVers. So a lot of RVers saw that because, as we know, RVers are well-connected in social media circles and said, we're going to boycott that town. We're not going to go there. We're not going to spend any of our money. And we don't like the people there because they don't like us as our viewers. So I did a little bit of research and I talked with Brian Byron Hickox, who is the um, land use administrator in the town of Waynesville, North Carolina. And Brian Byron, I'm going to call you Brian all day, but Byron I, has- I answer, uh, I answer to both. He answered to both, has agreed to come on and kind of straighten the record out because uh, you guys do like our viewers. And um, if you would we kind did. of tell us a little bit about the history about this, Byron, we'll uh, set the record straight. Sure, I'll, I'll kind of give you the background and you feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask any sure. questions. But uh, we had a preliminary proposal to put in uh, an RV park in one of our local uh, country clubs. And uh, it was just exactly that. It was preliminary. They had not spoken to anyone but staff. They brought in some preliminary drawings. And uh, over a weekend, someone uh, who had a copy of the preliminary drawings went around and put them in the mailboxes of uh, residents of that area, folks that lived at and around the country club. Um, and starting Monday morning and the remainder of that week, uh, I felt like that was all I talked about. I fielded phone calls and emails and in-person visits from folks who did not want any such thing uh, as part of the country club uh, golf course there. Even in-person so, visits? Oh, absolutely. They yeah. came down yeah. to yeah. town lots hall of, and- Lots of in-person visits. Knocked on your door. Were they all yes, local? Yes, came. Were they local residents and uh, abutters? Ab absolutely. They were all local residents who owned property. Uh, some of them lived here, lived here part of the year, but the majority of them live here all year. Okay. Uh, so we were instructed uh, as staff by the Board of Aldermen, which is our governing body, yeah. uh, to take this issue to the planning board and come back with recommendations for how we might address this. Uh, campgrounds at the time were only mentioned one time in our entire um, regulatory document, which is called our land development standards, and that was as part of the definition of a category called outdoor recreation facility. And that included things like golf courses, campgrounds, uh, batting cages, driving ranges, uh, athletic fields, horseback riding arenas, so a broad array of uses that all got lumped into one use. Mm -hmm. So to make a long story short, staff took uh, this issue to the planning board, which advises the Board of Aldermen. And the planning board recommended and the Board of Aldermen decided to adopt uh, four changes to the land development standards. One to redefine outdoor recreation facility and remove campground and um, 
country club slash golf course and give them their own separate definition. Separate definition. Uh, right. Create the definition for country club slash golf course and allow it only in low density districts. Create a standalone definition for campground and not allow campgrounds anywhere within the town's jurisdiction. And create a separate definition for recreational vehicle parks and not allow them anywhere within the town's jurisdiction. Uh, the reasoning was, and, and it was made very clear by the uh, attorney, that this can't just be, you don't like RVs. And if, it, if that were the case, that wouldn't be a reason because we don't have a dislike for RVs. Mm -hmm. Lots of the folks on our planning board are RVers. Um, several of our elected officials are RVers. Yeah. And I they think, just Byron, wanted to, I think yes. that's important to state that um, you have RVers amongst your governing board members. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the reasoning behind it was uh, the fact that uh, we currently have a housing shortage here in Waynesville. And so we are desperately trying to encourage more housing development. Uh, land is at a premium. Um, the town is limited in size. And so we wanted to reserve as much land as possible for residential development. Two, uh, there are an abundance of choices for RVers outside of the town's jurisdiction, sometimes literally just a stone's throw outside the town's jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. right. uh, an adjacent community is called Maggie Valley. Lots of choices for RVers and campers. Um, we have the Blue Ridge Parkway and Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which both have campgrounds uh, for tent campers as well as RVs uh, within just a short distance from Waynesville. So we felt like with an abundance of choices just outside of Waynesville's jurisdiction, and in an attempt to protect uh, developable land within the town, and also to keep in mind how a campground might impact uh, a residential neighborhood or residential area, the Board of Aldermen decided to not permit RV parks uh, nor campgrounds within the town's jurisdiction. Okay, and so when you say town, I mean, different parts of the country, um, you know, have different definition of town and township. You know, there's townships in New Jersey, there's towns in New England, there's county government in other right. parts of the country. But um, the town itself is a, is a not a, con I shouldn't say congested, but it's a, um, a dense populated, densely populated That's right. area. That's right. And we're rapidly becoming more uh, densely populated here in town. Um, we are about 10 square miles. Uh, we're a population of about 10,000 people. Uh, we're located in Haywood County, and Haywood County has a population of about 60,000 people. So the unincorporated portion of Haywood County uh, has lots of choices, as well as uh, adjacent communities, especially Maggie Valley, um, lots of choices for RVers and campers. Okay, so I think it should be uh, clearly and blatantly pointed out that you have nothing against RVers. You have nothing Absolutely against not. people no. that travel through your area because no. um, a lot of the, a lot of the um, conversation that took place over the weekend on the internet was that, mm -hmm. well, you know what? One person said, I'm gonna put a big red X over that town and spend my money somewhere else. Whereas others have said, look, in fact, there was even one resident from the town that said, there's where they were, where they were proposing it just wasn't the right place and- uh, that's that's how that's how I think everyone felt. Um, yeah. And and that's the concern is uh, certainly there's there's a place for everything. Um, but again, due to the fact that we are in an, a housing shortage right now, we're desperately trying to develop more housing in the town of Waynesville. And because there are other opportunities just outside our jurisdiction, this has nothing to do with a dislike for RVs uh, in general or in particular, but protecting uh, what little land the town has and trying to encourage it to be used for housing. And your job is to create the best use of the land. Well, create might be the wrong term, encourage. Encourage, okay, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, let, one, one final question. Um, when you're in the mountains or the foothills of the mountains, or are you in the mountains themselves? Uh, I, I'd say we're in the mountains. Yeah, okay. We're, we're just, uh, in 20 minutes, you can be in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, the most visited national park in America. Uh, in five minutes from the town's jurisdiction, you can be on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Okay, because a lot of people don't realize that when you're in a mountain area, um, the town may have a lot, may have uh, vacant land, but it's it's non-buildable land. Like that's 
absolutely right. Once you get above um, 2,900 feet or so, which you do very shortly after, after leaving the main part of town and you start heading up into the mountains, you're still in the town's jurisdiction. Uh, our jurisdiction goes almost to 5,000 square yeah. feet in, or, or 5,000 feet elevation in a few yeah. places. Um, so, yeah, a lot of that, you know, you can own a 10 acre piece of property and you're lucky if there is a place just barely big enough to grade out a house site. And develop it. So, <laughs> okay. And I, yeah. And I so, think, so I think that's yeah, you're, you're absolutely out. right to, to hit on that point that that all of the land in the town of Waynesville is by no means developable. So there you go, folks. You heard it straight from the source. So many times what you read in the media, what you see on TV, what you hear on the radio, what you see in blogs, especially, you know, the good part about social media is that everybody has their voice. The bad part about social media is that everybody has their voice and you really don't know who the, um, you know, the, the proper person to believe. So in this particular case, because the Camper Report is dedicated to making camping better for everyone, we wanted to go right to the source and find that out. And Byron Hickox from Waynesville, I wanna make sure I get the right, Wayne's right. World, right? Everybody call it Wayne's That's World. Right. Um, North Carolina, thank you so much for taking time thank from you. your busy day to talk Yes, sir, uh, talk thank you. Us. Okay, so stay with us here on the Camper Report show. We'll have a lot more right after these important messages. Hey guys, it's Phil and Stacy from You, Me, and the RV. We've been traveling around in our 35-foot motorhome for two years now, and I don't know how we could have done it without RV Trip Wizard. This easy-to-use RV trip planner makes sure we don't show up at the wrong campground on the wrong day. <laughs> right. Not that that's ever happened before. Want to learn more about this amazing trip planner? Head over to RVLife.com to learn more about the entire RV Life bundle. And you can thank us when you meet us on, on the road. road. Okay, welcome back everybody to the Camper Report Show. And today my guest is Jason Lippert, CEO of Lippert Components. And Jason, thank you very much for joining us today. And I know you're a business to business and you got the aftermarket products for LCI, but uh, for the consumers that may not have seen your face or know who you are, tell them a little bit about yourself. Oh man, uh, I've been <laughs> 26, year, 26 years in the business uh, here at LCI. Uh, my grandfather started the business, dad took it over, so it was a family business, and we were uh, acquired by a public company in 97. So we've we've grown from there from a, you know, $80 million business in the 90s to, you know, almost $3 billion today with over 12,000 team members and 90 locations all over the world. So most of it's right here in northern Indiana. So we have about 75% of our workforce here, and our, our core business is, you know, RV components and accessories and we innovate a lot around that space, but we also do quite a bit of work in the marine, uh, specialty vehicles, cargo trailers, anything you can, parts for anything you can tow behind a, a vehicle, as well as aftermarket and, and some RV and marine and train business in Europe. So that's our business in a nutshell. But you kind of glossed over it a little bit, but uh, it, it doesn't happen overnight that you go from $80 million to $3 billion. So there was a, there was a vision there early on under your leadership and you acquired a lot of companies that fit into the RVs and the RV lifestyle. And amazingly, a lot of people don't know this, but there are some RVs out there that will have, and it may be higher now, but 80% of the components of an RV, many travel trailers come from a component, a uh, Lippert component factory, right? Yeah. So, you know, we have probably higher content than most and, you know, the most you might find on a vehicle of LCI is, is maybe 35 to 40% of the content, which is still, uh, it's still a lot. We, we make a lot of different parts. So, um, but that's, uh, you know, that, that happened over time when we started the business, it was just chassis and we did really good at that. And people said, Hey, can you make axles? So we got into axles. They asked us, Hey, can you make slide outs? We did that. We eventually did windows and awnings and furniture and a whole lot of other stuff. Some through organic product development and then some through acquisition, like you mentioned. Well, what I really wanted to talk to you about this morning is sometimes people don't see the things that many of our companies, the companies, the dealers themselves, I know our dealers uh, do a lot of things in the community, but you've got two projects that get, are getting a lot of attention right now and, and justifiably so. 
Let's talk about your community outreach, because I know that was a vision of yours a couple of years ago in the 100,000 hours, but tell us what you're doing in the communities where you have plants. Yeah, so I, I would say, you know, four or five years ago, we were at a strategic planning meeting, and I would love to take credit for the idea, but I can't. Uh, but uh, we do our, our five, you know, uh, annual objectives every year. And one of our executives said, hey, you know what? We do these financial objectives every year. And there's not a person on the executive committee of 20 that doesn't serve the community one way, shape or form. Why don't we have, a, you know, a, a social impact goal or, or a community service goal? So we thought about it and we tried to figure out, OK, well, what would that look like? And we eventually said, hey, look, let's. We've got, you know, back then we had maybe 50 facilities and we said, hey, if every facility has a serving hours goal, we try to bring more people in to uh, serve at each of the facilities. Our, our team members uh, encourage them to serve, set up serving opportunities so we can do it as a work family and not just, uh, you know, hoping that people do good things when they leave our building, um, kind of encourage it inside our four walls. Uh, that's how the the idea was birthed, and you know we came up with 100,000 hours, and we've been calling it the 100,000 hours uh, community service campaign ever since we we launched it four or five years ago. We hired a director of philanthropy. We have champions, uh, philanthropy champions at every one of our facilities, and the goal is to do four serving events at every of all of our 90 facilities uh, today um, uh, every year. So when we do that when we champion those um, those serving events at every facility, they look different. We let the plants choose what they want to do. Uh, some might want to serve kids. Some might want to serve the elderly. Some do uh, parks and recreation. I mean, there's a whole host of, I think there's 162 charities or something just in our county here alone uh, in Northern Indiana where we can uh, we can get our people to serve. So a lot of it for us is just, you know, getting the people that have never served before and get them and their family serving and create the opportunity for them to do it. Cause I don't think people didn't want to serve. It's just that, you know, they don't know how they get busy, but when we create the space and opportunity for them to do it, it really makes an impact to the community. And probably the, the, the thing we're most focused on today is now that we're in that momentum is try to help other companies and business that see what we're doing there. Just take steps and get the same thing moving and, and their their businesses so if everybody's if all the businesses were serving every community in the country how great could our country be how great could our communities be that's kind of the goal yeah and and you know you said uh, the magic words there that that people ask you know i think there's a lot of people who would jump on that bandwagon both at lippert and other companies if people simply asked them hey would you like to come down to the ball field on saturday morning yeah. We'll, we'll help the little league uh, plant some new grass or something. They will do it. People, yeah. people, are, people are generally very good, big hearted, and they would do it. And yeah. it's, it's great the, the effort that you put into it in leading it and, and hopefully others in Elkhart because you have such a great base there with the RV companies uh, will jump on board. Tell me about this new project. I, I just found out about it. I just happened to see a, a, <laughs> a Facebook posting from your, your brand ambassador the other day, but uh, Tell us about the campground project, because here we are at the Camper Report Show, and we got a lot of campers out there looking there, and you're going to see somebody from Lippert, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, you're going to find that if you if you pay attention to LCI, there's a lot of stuff we throw at the wall, and some of it sticks, and some of it doesn't. <laughs> but, you know, I'd say our, you know, our consumer journey uh, and an effort to try to really get connected more with the consumers Um you know, really started a few years ago. I mean, if you go back to the 90s, when I first started, it was very much in, you know, a, a supplier to OEM business. And we have great relationships with our OEM customer partners. Uh, that continued through the 2000s to about 2012. And we woke up and realized that dealers needed better service than what we were giving them. We were supplying so many components and uh, products and and really didn't have a robust service area set up. So in 2012, we set out to do that and built out a service network for the dealers, technical service training, all that kind of stuff. And then we got to the last few years and we realized, man, we're really missing that connection to the consumers. They're ultimately, you know, we're getting 50 to 70,000 phone calls a month 
uh, on customer service, repair and replacement. Hey, how do I work this? Hey, I need this replaced and fixed. And we just realized we didn't have that component in place. So we immediately, you know, uh, beefed up our, our service area again. Uh, recently, we announced uh, this year, Nicole Salt, who's our, our, our director of customer experience for the company. We never had a customer experience department and most, most businesses in our industry don't, but we've, we've uh, set aside the resources now to have, you know, how, how do we make that customer experience better? And, you know, organically, as they've kind of grown that department, one of their great ideas was, hey, we need, we need more ambassadors. We need uh, to be connected to the ambassadors out there promoting their RV lifestyle. We need ambassadors that are out there promoting, you know, Lippert and all the things that we do and all the things that we can do for the consumers to make the experience better so that they're likely to buy that second and third and fourth RV over their life cycle. Um, and make the camping experience more enjoyable. So uh, the campground project, you know, birthed out of, you know, um, one of our team members that have been with us for almost 20 years, and he just loves camping. Um, and uh, he's, he's in his mid 70s, and he's been a close friend, and he's invented a whole host of products for us over the years, leveling and hydraulic landing gear and some of our slide out products. Um, but he loves camping and we just said, hey, look, you know, how would you like to go on the road? Uh, he loves camping. He loves to be around people, uh, talking to stories, video, you know, videoing their stories and their questions for us and uh, when he is out. So what we did is we just said, hey, look, we'll put you on the road for a year with a motorhome. Uh, we'll do some, you know, uh, campfire chats. We'll organize some of the campers that are at the campgrounds that all around the country. We'll send you to rallies and we'll just have you talk to people and get feedback for us so that we can, you know, be better positioned on understanding really what the consumer wants and not be sitting in our meeting rooms here trying to help decide what the customer should have um, and really get that input and feedback for new products and, you know, uh, also how to make our existing products better. So the campground project launched here you know, just recently, and it'll go, uh, it, it'll go to a lot of campgrounds here later in the year, and then all through 2021. That's, that's fantastic. So they should look for that. So the, the other thing that you put on the company um, is this branding towards the consumers, because I know, number one, you do a lot of dealer training, the dealers around the country really, you know, you've got one of the better training programs for dealers and technicians. But now you've extended that into the parts and accessory store with a, a large aftermarket presence. So people are going to see the black and yellow logos and the, the Libet logos on many products that are on the OEM side. But now you've taken those to the, to the consumer side in the parts and accessory store also. And that's, that's been a big part of your, your company the last year or two, right? That's right. That's right. We've, uh, you know, again, we started kind of, selling products in the aftermarket in probably 2013. And, you know, uh, we really didn't have much of any sales into the dealerships and wholesale distributors and consumer outlets, e-com, all that kind of, uh, all those kind of channels. And today, you know, it's, it's over $500 million. So, um, you know, we're, again, we're really trying to listen to consumers and, you know, that we feel that the, the, the look of the retail stores can be improved. So we're trying to have, you know, we want, you know, consumers to come into the store and find things that'll improve their, their camping experience. And, you know, if they're not inspired when they walk into a store and, you know, inspired by the, the look of the store and the look of the products, uh, they're not always necessarily inspired to, to buy something that's going to make their experience better. So a lot of it's marketing. We're trying to get the products out there. Uh, we're working close, more closely with dealers. We've got a lot of social media going on to help inform consumers about what's available to them to upgrade their experience. Because uh, let's face it, the RV manufacturers, they're doing the right thing. They want to make RVs affordable. Uh, and, and that means that you can't put every bell and whistle on the unit um, uh, on the, on, to, at, at the manufacturing level. So uh, the dealers need to be able to supply all those bells and whistles to help you know make that experience better for the for the camper so that they have the opportunity to really really enjoy their experience better than what they might have with standard equipment on a vehicle well you're right you get a chance to customize it make it their own and uh, enjoy right. the experience jason i want to thank you very much for joining us at the camper report show this morning uh always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, we'll look forward to seeing bob on the road with the campground project and uh, continued success for lci you're doing a great job over there Thanks a lot, Bob. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye now. Take care.
Thank you for joining us on the show this week. And if you like this show, hit that subscribe button down below. Down in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, there's a little button that says subscribe. And then when that is done, there's a little bell that pops up. Hit the bell so that every time we have a new show, you'll be the first to see it. And tell all your friends about it.